the late Sheikh Mbarak al-Sabah, the seventh ruler of the state of Kuwait and known as Great Mbarak, asked for British protection in September 1897 due to a dispute with the Ottoman state. His demand was rejected by the British government on the pretext of it being unnecessary for them to intervene in the region. However, it changed its position and agreed on signing an agreement on January 23, 1899. One of the most prominent conditions of the agreement is that Sheikh Mbarak would not accept any agent or representative of any foreign country without the British government's consent. Sheikh Mbarak agreed that Britain assign a commissioner in Kuwait, leading to the appointment of Captain Knox in August of 1904. He stayed on as commissioner until April 28, 1906. The position of commissioner continued to be filled until the declaration of Kuwait's independence in 1961. Well, this agreement is an excellent agreement between Sheikh Mbarak at that time, Queen uh, Victoria, and it happens in uh, Sheikh Mbarak was uh, has uh, an excellent vision for the future. He kept Kuwait and reserve, you know, that Kuwait kept it, you know, under uh, at that time British Empire or United Kingdom Empire. Uh, and it happens and saved us from so many invaders at that time. Ottoman Empire, uh, Russia, and uh, Germany. And what the good things about the agreement that the British, they had no interference in Kuwait internal efforts, it's just uh, internal uh, events. But with the uh, British, we can uh, consult about the outside agreements or outside activities and it's really reserved us and Sheikh Mbarak was excellent was very shrewd and uh, smart to give us you know this uh, treaty after the treaty uh, 1899 we terminated this in 1961 and Kuwait became independent country. And we have, it happens that our relation remains a very an excellent relation for the whole years. Kuwait took advantage of this treaty to build and strengthen the basis of a modern state. This treaty has provided foreign political stability and protection from external threats and greed. Rulers of Kuwait were able to care for and build the emirate after the concern of external greed was eliminated. Therefore, schools were built, such as Mbarakiya and Ahmadiyya schools. The Shura Council was established in 1921. The first municipal election was held in 1932. The Legislative Council was established in 1938, and in 1936, the Health and Education Councils were established, followed by the Public Security Department in 1938 and the Orphanage Department in 1939. In addition, His Highness Sheikh Ahmed al Jabur signed an agreement with American and British companies to explore oil in 1934. The 1899 agreement between Britain and Kuwait I think was essentially a smart and pragmatic move by a small country like Kuwait right on the border beside a, a large and aggressive empire. So outsourcing one's own defence capability to another country where there's a trusting, friendly relationship it saved a lot of money, it saved a lot of energy, so Kuwait could focus on internal domestic politics. So looking back at it, it was actually quite a clever move. And it seems to have worked out fairly well, I think, for both countries. And what I'm particularly struck by is the content of the exchange of letters that were exchanged in 1961 when the agreement came to an end, where it talks about the, the continued relationship between uh, Britain and Kuwait being governed by a spirit of friendship. So it's very nice to read something positive like that at the end of this sort of agreement. 
The era of the late His Highness Sheikh Abdullah Salem marked the first step taken on the path of independence. His Highness had taken vigorous steps towards establishing an independent constitutional state ever since he took office in 1950. His Highness worked on issuing laws and legislations that support the establishment of an independent state such as nationality and judiciary organization laws in 1959 and monetary law in 1960. The Fatwa and Legislation Department were established in the same year. The laws and legislations, as well as governmental departments, were considered pillars of the state. An abundance of factors contributed directly and indirectly towards Kuwaiti independence as well as internally and externally. The Kuwaiti people's voices were raised, calling for independence, which made Sheikh Abdullah Salem invest his efforts to declare independence. Therefore, he expressed to the British that Kuwait desires to end the protection treaty and replace it with another agreement suitable for political development in the local, regional and international realms. He reiterated the importance of respecting the desire of the Kuwaiti people to have full independence. The actual date of independence for Kuwait was on June 19, 1961, when His Highness the late Emir Sheikh Abdullah Salem Sabah presented two important memorandums to the British political residency in the Arabian Gulf, Sir William Loos. The memorandums contained the cancellations of the 1898 treaty as it is incompatible with the sovereignty and independence of Kuwait and that relations between the two countries shall continue on the basis of a strong friendship. Well, the situation between Kuwait and the United Kingdom is example for how we uh, deal with the situation. United Kingdom and Kuwait, they uh, have respects to each other. They do together towards many issues, include, including Corona. And uh, coronavirus affecting all of the world. But we have, with the United Kingdom, a lot of talks how to solve the, uh, this issue, not between Kuwait and United Kingdom but for United Kingdom and Kuwait towards the whole world. And that shows, you know, how excellent relation between us and the United Kingdom. Kuwait is here. You know, we have students. We have more than 7,500 7, students. We have patients, thousands of patients uh, been here uh, in the past. And we have tourists also. It shows, you know, that's how strong the relation between United Kingdom and Kuwait. The Kuwaiti-British Friendship Treaty of 1899 was enormously significant for both nations. It was the first ever formal engagement between the then ruler of Kuwait and the government of any other country. Only days after signing the treaty, on the 4th of February 1899, the British government uh, sent instructions to deploy a naval force to prevent any attacks on Kuwait. Since 1899, the UK has maintained its commitment to Kuwait security and deployed forces on several notable occasions, including seeing the first ever overseas deployment of the then newly formed Royal Air Force in 1920. Shortly after Kuwait's independence in 1961, the UK responded to a request from His Highness the then Emir Sheikh Abdullah Al Salam Al Sabah for military support. The UK's response was to send a joint task force on Operation Vantage. This saw the rapid deployment of a strong naval task force, which included aircraft carriers, several destroyers and frigates, and minesweepers, together with Royal Marines commandos. In addition to the aircraft from the uh, the fleet air arm on board the aircraft carriers. The Royal Air Force sent two Canberra reconnaissance aircraft and a squadron of Hunter fighter attack aircraft. And within a month of independence and the deployment of the Royal Navy, uh, Royal Marines and Royal Air Force, the force was reinforced by British Army units from the UK, which included Centurion tanks, light armour and artillery and paratroopers. 
Independence means freedom of the state, its recognition as an independent entity, and the right to conduct their affairs under the tutelage of no one. This was achieved through the independence agreement signed by the father of the constitution and emir at the time, His Highness Sheikh Abdullah Salem. The new era of independence came with the necessity of taking on many new legal, constitutional, and diplomatic procedures, the most prominent of which was the issuance of an Amiri decree that called for general elections for a constituent assembly authorized to draft the state constitution. Nine months after the constituents were elected, the Constitution of Kuwait, consisting of 183 articles, was penned and presented to His Highness Sheikh Abdullah Salem, who ratified and issued it on November 11, 1962. Moreover, the old flag of Kuwait, which was red in color and had the word Kuwait in the center, was replaced with a new flag. On January 23, 1962, as an implementation of the constitutional provisions, the first parliamentary election in the modern history of Kuwait was held, choosing 50 members representing 10 constituencies. On January 29, 1963, His Highness Sheikh Abdullah Salem inaugurated the first National Assembly in the history of Kuwait. Kuwait's independence allowed it to insert itself into the international community in accordance with a special policy based on pursuing peace, achieving cooperation, and promoting brotherhood and friendship among all nations in the world. The first step onto the diplomatic and political arena was establishing the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to pursue the policy's demands. Therefore, an Amiri decree was issued on August 19, 1961 to establish a foreign department to carry out the foreign affairs of the state. A government secretariat was installed in the foreign department, which then led to the formation of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The Security Council, at its 1034th meeting held on May 7, 1963, unanimously decided to recommend to the General Assembly that Kuwait be admitted as a member of the United Nations. Following this recommendation, the General Assembly, at its fourth special session in its 1203rd plenary meeting on May 14, 1963, adopted Resolution 1872, admitting the state of Kuwait to the UN. As a result, Kuwait became the 111th member state. His Highness the late Amir, Sheikh Sabah Al Ahmed Al Jabr Al Sabah, serving as foreign minister at the time, addressed the General Assembly at its fourth special session. The flag raising ceremony of the state of Kuwait at the UN headquarters took place on May 15, 1963. Since its admission, Kuwait has made significant contributions to the work of the UN and has been an active partner, working closely to promote the noble principles and purposes of the UN Charter. The permanent mission to the state of Kuwait has been responsible for carrying out the country's active participation in the UN. When Kuwait was invaded and occupied by the former Iraqi regime in August 1990, Britain under Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher played a leading role in securing the UN mandate for an international coalition to be formed for the liberation of Kuwait. Kuwait is a proud member of the international coalition and it saw the largest deployment of British military forces since the Second World War. Britain takes pride to this day um, in, uh, for our armed forces who served bravely alongside coalition and Kuwaiti friends and succeeded in restoring Kuwait's sovereignty and independence in 1991. Although a small country, the state of Kuwait has multilateral depth, knowledge and experience stemming from its memberships in various regional and international organizations, most notably the Cooperation Council for the Arab States of the Gulf, the Arab League, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the Group of 77 plus China, and the Non-Aligned Movement. Its multilateral diplomacy dealings via these numerous diverse organizations have given Kuwait experience in mediating between parties as well as fostering partnerships in the midst of multifaceted challenges that have threatened regional and international peace and security. 
Furthermore, Kuwait held a non-permanent seat in the UN, primarily responsible for maintaining international peace and security, that being in the Security Council twice. The first term was from 1978 to 79, during the tenure of Ambassador Abdullah Bshara. The second term was from 2018 to 19, during the tenure of Ambassador Mansour al -Hatabi. Just a few months after its independence in 1961, the state of Kuwait established the Kuwait Fund for Arab Economic Development, becoming the first developing country to establish a fund to provide economic assistance to fellow developing countries. Robert McNamara, the president of the World Bank from 1968 to 81, wrote of the fund, when first established in 1961, the Kuwait Fund was without precedent. Here was Kuwait, a tiny country until recently among the poorest places on earth, establishing a development fund in the year of its political independence. While welcoming its newfound prosperity, it was declaring a willingness to share its future wealth with its Arab neighbors. Since its establishment in 1961, the Kuwait Fund has provided over 900 development assistance loans to over 100 nations, totaling over 19 billion US dollars, making it one of the most active players in the field of development. The 70th United Nations General Assembly session was a milestone in the organization's history since the adoption of the post-2015 Sustainable Development Goals. In Kuwait, the international community can be rest assured of a committed partner in development that will play an important role in international efforts towards helping developing nations achieve sustainable goals. Kuwait has announced that it will continue to provide development assistance loans within the program of the Kuwait Fund's operations over the coming 15 years in the amount of 15 billion US dollars to achieve the noble and ambitious sustainable development agenda. The rise in the number of conflicts in the world has also brought with it challenges of a humanitarian nature, most notably displaced persons, refugees and a lack of basic needs. Suffering in the world has reached levels not seen since World War II. As of May 2016, the number of people in need of humanitarian assistance was a staggering 130 million worldwide. Conflicts have driven tens of millions of innocent people to the edge of survival. The Syrian conflict, which has been ongoing since 2011, is the most notable of these conflicts, with many labeling it as the worst humanitarian crisis of our generation. In response to the dire situation, Kuwait, at the request of the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, hosted three international humanitarian pledging conferences for Syria, Kuwait 1 in 2013, Kuwait 2 in 2014, and Kuwait 3 in 2015. This was a clear testament to Kuwait's global commitment to humanitarian action. Kuwait pledged $300 million in Kuwait 1, $500 million in Kuwait 2, and $500 million in Kuwait 3. Over $7 billion were raised at these three pledging conferences in order to alleviate suffering and provide security and solace to those who have suffered so much as a result of the Syrian conflict. Furthermore, Kuwait co-chaired, along with the United Kingdom, Norway and Germany, the Supporting Syria and the Region Conference held in London in February 2016. Kuwait once again pledged significantly in the sum of $300 million. In addition, Kuwait was actively engaged at the First World Humanitarian Summit held in Istanbul in May 2016, in which His Highness the late Amir, Sheikh Sabah al-Ahmed al-Jabr al-Sabah, headed the state of Kuwait's delegation. Kuwait's exemplary leadership in global humanitarian action was recognized by the UN at a ceremony held at the UN headquarters on September 9, 2014, whereby His Highness the late Amir, Sheikh Sabah al-Ahmed al-Jabr al-Sabah, was presented with a certificate of appreciation by the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon in recognition of His Highness's generous contributions, efforts, and continuous support as a humanitarian leader towards the UN humanitarian operations to save lives and alleviate suffering around the world. 
Such humanitarian contributions has seen Kuwait ranked by the Global Humanitarian Assistance Report of 2015 as the top donor of international humanitarian assistance as a percentage of its gross national income in 2014 at 0.24%. Kuwait was ranked by the IRIN as the most generous humanitarian aid donor in 2015 at 0.184%. Furthermore, Oxfam reported that Kuwait was the most generous in its funding committed to the Syrian crisis response appeals for 2015 as a percentage of the fair share contributed, standing at 554%. Well, uh, internal, as I mentioned, you know, that Kuwait became uh, the first Gulf countries where the development and uh, issue the prosperity of its people which is very good, you know, and Kuwaitis are very uh, satisfied with this. With the Arab League, you know, since we joined the Arab League, uh, and Kuwait has its policy, it's been, uh, you know, the policy of peace and tranquility among the other countries. They're keeping the countries together. Uh, we don't want, you know, any dispute. We played with Lebanon, with Yemen, with Syria, with the, a lot of countries, you know, in the Arab world and outside of the Arab world, like Afghanistan, like Iran, like, so that it shows Kuwait so popular among the other countries, including United Kingdom. Well, uh, foreign affairs, as you know, Sheikh Sabah, late Sheikh Sabah Al-Ahmed wanted, you know, that to become the first uh, institution who defends Kuwait. And uh, during the Iraqi invasion, you know, we were the uh, foreign office and the embassies, you know, outside Kuwait, they played a big part of liberating Kuwait. To mention, to uh, terrify, you know, uh, to identify the situation between Kuwait, Iraq, and the area, and the Gulf Cooperation Council, of course. His achievement is a great achievement. And I think, you know, by uh, his, all of his decorations and uh, prizes, it shows that Sheikh Sabah was the figure who is not forgettable, uh, a figure that you saw by yourself and the Kuwaiti. So how many people, you know, they came for the funeral. We told them uh, that uh, uh, Sheikh Sabah, when they came to his mourning or his condolences, Sheikh Sabah was a great man in the situation and he did uh, everything to keep the walls peacefully and uh, reserve the uh, dispute among people among countries in this uh, level it shows you know it shows how kuwait is so important despite its uh, small size and the small population. Kuwait is uh, playing the role of the uh, peaceful role in everybody, in everywhere. And uh, they uh, identify as a country of peace and humanity and donations, you know, for the poorer countries. And that's what Kuwait, despite its size, a small size, and despite its uh, population. And you can see that the expatriate in Kuwait, more than Kuwaiti itself, that's what it shows in Kuwait. It's a popular and safer place in the world and in this area. I believe the relations between our two nations are in a good place and poised to go to even greater heights. And I don't believe the pandemic has affected those relations at all. If anything, it's enhanced them. We've become more innovative in the manner in which we have pushed business forward 
in order to make progress against the exciting projects that I've mentioned earlier. The fact that we've achieved this, I think, uh, stands testament and we're all eagerly waiting the opportunity when the restrictions can be sensibly relaxed. In appreciation of the great role played by the late Emir Sheikh Abdullah Salem in Kuwait's independence and in laying down the foundation of a modern state, a decree was issued in 1963 to combine National Day with accession to the Throne Day on February 25th, which is the date His Highness assumed the throne in 1950. The Constitution of Kuwait, which regulates the relationship between the ruler and the citizens, protects freedom, serves justice, and promises equality. It was Monday, November 11th, 1962, when the late Emir Sheikh Abdullah Salim al Sabah, the 11th ruler of Kuwait, fondly known as the father of the constitution, approved the constitution. It is the first of its kind in the Arab Gulf region. It contributed in building a modern state based on constitutional institutions and a system founded on the principles of rights and duties. The Constitution is an expression of the will of the ruler and the citizen to live within the framework of an active constitutional democracy and build a state of law. It is also a document that determines the system of the state and regulates the relationship between the executive, legislative and judicial authorities. Prior to the issuance of the Constitution, Kuwaitis elected the Constituent Assembly in January 1962 to draft the first constitution of the nation. The Assembly formed a five-member committee committee to oversee the wording of the draft to define the entity of the state of Kuwait. The final document was presented to Sheikh Abdullah Salem, who then delivered a speech at the inauguration of the Constituent Assembly, in which he said, In the name of Allah, we start the sessions of the Constituent Assembly, which is entrusted with laying the foundations of the future ruling system. Sheikh Abdullah Salem called for political unity to better serve the interests of the country and its people. He ended his speech by asking Allah the Almighty to guide them. Abdul Latif Nayan al Ghanim was elected as chairman of the assembly and Dr. Ahmed al Khatib as vice chairman. The five member committee consisted of al Ghanim, then Interior Minister Sheikh Saad al Abdullah Salem al Sabah, Justice Minister Hamoud Zaid al Khalid, Constituent Assembly member and Committee Secretary Ya'goub Yusuf al Hamadi, and Assembly member Late Saud Abdul Aziz al Abdul Razag. The Assembly's Secretary General, Ali Mohammed al Radwan, handled administration of the committee. Meetings of the committee were attended by legal expert Mohsen Abdul Hafid and constitutional law specialist Dr. Uthman Khalil Uthman. The participation of the late Amir Sheikh Saad al Abdullah Salem was politically significant because he represented the ruling family, a prelude since Sheikh Abdullah Salem presided over the Legislative Council in 1938. The Constitutional Committee, which held 23 sessions, met for the first time on Saturday, March 17, 1962, and for the last time on October 27, 1962. The committee then tabled the draft constitution to the assembly for discussion. The Constituent Assembly began deliberating the draft constitution on August 12, 1962. In a meeting held on October 30th, the articles of the draft were read and the constitution was then adopted unanimously in a session held on November 3rd, 1962. The chairman of the Constituent Assembly presented the new constitution to the late Emir Sheikh Abdullah Salem at Sif Palace on November 8, 1962. Al-Ghanim said in his speech, It is a great honor for my colleagues, members of the Constitution Committee and myself to present to your highness on this historic day and on behalf of the Constituent Assembly a draft of the constitution based on your decision to form the basis of democratic principles. The late Emir, Sheikh Abdullah Salem, ratified the constitution three days after submission and it was published in the official gazette the day after it was approved. Just 72 days after the constitution was approved, the first parliamentary elections were held in Kuwait on January 23, 1963, which officially marked the start of political practice under the new constitution. It was the gateway to the birth of the three main constitutional authorities, legislative, executive and judicial. 
Kuwait's constitution consists of 183 articles distributed to five chapters. The first concerns the state and the system of government, the second about the fundamentals of Kuwaiti society, the third is dedicated to public rights and duties, the fourth about authorities, and the fifth is about general and transitional provisions. On February 10, 1980, the late Emir Sheikh Jabir al Ahmed al Sabah formed a committee that consisted of 35 members to revise and amend the constitution. The late Emir Sheikh Saad al Abdullah Salim al Sabah attended the constitutional revision committee, which held its first meeting on February 19, 1980. He called on members to preserve the constitution and safeguard its basic principles, stressing on the responsibility of the committee to serve the people of Kuwait and secure their prosperity prosperity and stability. The Constitutional Revision Committee met for 18 weeks and discussed many points of views. Meetings ended on June 22, 1980. Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, the citizens displayed this genuine unity vis-a-vis -vis the Constitution. So I'm, I'm learning more every day as I spend more time in Kuwait about Kuwait's long and proud history. Um, I'm also very interested in some of the future looking developments which are very wide ranging. So cyber security is something that um, I'm learning more about, there's a clear British interest in that. Um, it's something that we are a global leader in, but looking at how Kuwait is keen to protect itself and its citizens and its national infrastructure by having a better cyber security capability, I think that's one example of looking forward to the future. Another area that I've been very struck by and I'm keen to know more about um, is diversification away from hydrocarbons. This is obviously of huge interest to the UK because of upcoming COP26. And I visited a solar power plant where there's also um, wind energy as well being looked at, at by the Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research. And I think that project is, is very interesting in terms of how Kuwait is looking more broadly about what can be done differently and better in the future. The UK is working very closely to assist Kuwait to develop capabilities to address emerging, contemporary and technologically challenging threats of the modern era. Cyber defence and the ability to defend against autonomous air systems or drones and similar systems in the maritime arena. Furthermore, the technological advancements being brought into service with Kuwait Air Force, with the Super Hornet and the Typhoon fighter jets, together with new helicopters, Efforts towards building the state following independence reflect the wisdom of the political leadership and stand as an indicator of the providing of a brighter future for achievements in the Kuwaiti arena. Therefore, it is worth mentioning a few of these achievements. The current generation is proud of these achievements and of those who played a great role in paving the path for future generations to take remarkable steps of their own. Cooperative societies are considered among the most important economic factions in Kuwait. They encompass 70% of the retail trade in the country. In addition, they play an important social and political role in direct contact with the people. Cooperative societies in Kuwait look very much like modern commercial complexes. The first attempts of consumer cooperation in Kuwait started at Mubarakiya School in 1941 with the establishing of a school cooperative society. Some other cooperative societies followed in other governmental entities in 1955, such as the Cooperative Society of Social Affairs Department and the Education Department. Those cooperatives were subject to the law of social organizations and clubs due to the non-existence of a law for cooperatives at the time. Duly organized consumer cooperatives started with the issuance of Law Number no. 20 of 1962, which delegated their establishment, membership, management, control, dissolving and liquidation. 
In the early 80s, the cooperative movement became open to Arab and international cooperative movements, leading to the Kuwaiti Union for Cooperative Societies to seek membership in the International Cooperative Alliance as of March 1981. It is worth mentioning that cooperative societies spend 25% of their annual profits on social services in their area, including organizing pilgrimage and umrah visits, providing schools and hospitals with basic needs, and organizing social, educational and recreational programs for the residents of the area. Among the leading projects organized by the cooperative societies is the establishment of a modern specialized hospital for cardiac diseases and diagnostic radiology, costing approximately 15 million Kuwaiti dinars. Kuwait soon recognized that social security is a social and humanitarian responsibility. This urged the government to establish social systems through which it can guarantee a source of income for those unable to work. To guarantee security, the laws of public aid and of social security were issued. So one of the things that I'm really struck by in Kuwait is this sense of, of being a mediator and a broker and a continued willingness to help neighbours um, or even countries further afield to resolve some of their problems. And it seems to be hardwired into Kuwaitis to play this mediator role. Um, I suppose some of it maybe is from being a smaller country in a difficult region, but this is a, a long-standing approach. I've been very interested to know more about the, the Diwaniers, this sense of opening one's house and talking to strangers, sitting down and talking to people about things, instead of, of maybe being um, hostile or resistant to, to new people or new ideas. So I think that's very interesting. And just looking at Kuwait's involvement in the region, different regional disputes, for example, Yemen, um, where they've been so supportive at the moment of the, the talks that are going on, but also their involvement there dates back to the 1960s of trying to smooth things over and, and try to resolve problems. Another outstanding example of Kuwait acting as a mediator is, of course, the more recent Gulf dispute, um, which was, was moved forward significantly in January. His Highness Sheikh Nawab is really a statesman and a great man. He is with the Sheikh, with the late Sheikh Sabah. They were together for a quite number of years. They're working together to keep Kuwait safe, prosperous, and also to deal with the Arab uh, countries. His Highness Sheikh Nawaf, well, uh, as everybody knows, what he did for Al Ula uh, Agreement. They kept the whole Gulf together. Uh, they wanted, you know, that to keep the Gulf uh, as a one uh, economic and political uh, block. And he succeeded in that. That's what everybody in the Gulf uh, feels, uh, that they are uh, grateful to Sheikh Nawaf, to His Highness Sheikh Nawaf, and to other for what they've done. The Kuwait Foundation for the Advancement of Sciences, a private foundation of public interest, was established pursuant to the Amiri Decree issued on December 12, 1976. KFAS is managed by a board of directors chaired by His Highness the Emir of Kuwait and includes six members elected by Kuwaiti joint stock companies for the term of three years. The general objective of KFAS is to provide support for scientific and cultural advancement. In its meeting held on February 9, 2009, under the chairmanship of His Highness the Emir, Sheikh Sabah al Ahmed al Jabr al Sabah, the KFAS board of directors approved the initiation of His Highness establishing the Sabah al Ahmed Center for Giftedness and Creativity. The center includes a number of creative activities, innovations, and inventions. It also offers activities to help develop technical skills, activities for young scientists, and provides encouragement to the distinguished, talented, and creative people in various fields.
On November 28, 1976, an Amiri decree was issued concerning the oil reserve for future generations by opening a special account for the oil fortune composed of 50% of the general reserve of the country in the first year to be annually funded by deducting 10% of the general revenues of the country as of the fiscal year 1976-77. to 77. These funds were to be reinvested into the same account. The Public Investment Authority is responsible for reinvestments of the account funds on behalf of the government in different local and international projects. The Future Generations Fund is the source the government uses to cover any economic crises the country may encounter until such a situation is corrected. Kuwait Fund for Arab Economic Development Kuwait's conscience is always on alert to the suffering and agony of developing countries. Decades ago, even before the discovery of oil, Kuwait has always understood the feelings of countries in need and has worked hard at helping alleviate struggles with development. Kuwait considers itself one of the developing countries, yet it never hesitates to deduct a considerable part of its national income to helping other countries. Based on this principle, the Kuwait Fund for Arab Economic Development was established to be the first Kuwaiti channel for providing help and support for developing countries and assisting them in fulfilling their development programs and projects. The foundation of the fund was announced in December 1961, becoming the first development organization in the Middle East and founded by Kuwait directly following its independence, providing assistance for developing Arab countries. The idea of establishing the fund was proposed by His Highness the late Emir, Sheikh Jabr al-Ahmed al-Jabr al-Sabah, when he was the Minister of Finance. The establishment of the Kuwait Fund was a manifestation of understanding the reality of the development crisis confronted by the Third World. Despite its small size, Kuwait was willing to dedicate a part of its income in service of development and assisting developing countries in their economies, providing them with loans and necessary aid for financing the execution of programs and projects. This grants the benefiting countries the highest possible economic and social benefits. In July 1974, it was decided that the reach of the fund was to be expanded to cover all developing countries, and therefore its capital was increased from 200 million dinars to 1 billion Kuwaiti dinars. In March of 1981, the capital was doubled to 2 billion. There is no doubt that the Kuwait Fund succeeded in realizing its objectives and actively participated in building the massive reputation of Kuwait in the field of economic development and humanitarian aid. This reflected positively on fostering the ties between Kuwait and countries receiving such aid who show solidarity and friendship towards Kuwait on the international stage.